welcome to Ipsa Dixit, a podcast on legal scholarship. I'm your host, Brian L. Fry, Spears Gilbert Associate Professor of Law at the University of Kentucky College of Law. My guest is Ryan Vaca, Professor of Law at the University of New Hampshire Franklin Pierce School of Law. We will discuss his article, Uncertainty in Employee Status Across Federal Law, which will be published in the Temple Law Review. So welcome to the show, Ryan. Thanks. Thanks for having me. Yeah, it's my pleasure. And um, I've been following your work in this area for a long time with great interest because of it's very, imp of course, it's very important in in copyright law for a number of different reasons, as you mentioned in in your paper. And I hope we can talk about that more later in in the interview. But I was wondering if you know maybe for listeners who aren't that familiar <laughs> with this area of law, uh, you could talk a little bit about why federal law distinguishes between employees and non-employees or independent contractors? Yeah, so the um, so federal law, lots of different areas of federal law do this. They draw this distinction. Um, and it's really, you know, sort of a coverage issue. So the, some of the statutes that, uh, that draw the distinction, we've got the National Labor Relations Act, we have the Copyright Act, uh, ERISA, uh, OSHA, the Occupational Safety and Health Act, Americans with Discrimination, Americans with Disabilities Act, the Age Discrimination and Employment Act, Title VII. So lots of lots of areas draw this distinction, and it really um, is trying to figure out sort of who's covered by the act and who's not. Um, what types of protections we're going to afford to some people and not to others. So, so sort of, what's the history? of this distinction then? Like when did federal law start distinguishing between employees and non-employees and, and why? Yeah, so the um, I mean, all of the history dates back to to England, like like everything, right? Um, and what we're trying to do is distinguish between uh, when employers should be liable for the really the negligent acts of their employees or the the people that they hire, um, and you know it it goes through sort of a transition over time, but we start thinking about whether or not the the employer, the hiring party, has the right to control the employee, the hired party. Um, and if they do, then the courts were more likely to impose sort of tort liability on the hiring party. But if they didn't have control over them, if they were what we would now call an independent contractor, then the courts were, would say, yeah, we're not so, we're not so keen on in, imposing liability. This is really somebody doing their own, uh, doing their own job. Um, and so the the court sort of drew that distinction. We start to see it in federal law, and then those were you know those were all sort of common law torts. We start to see it in federal law um, in the uh, with the the introduction of kind of social welfare legislation and the uh, National Labor Relations Act in particular. So when those federal statutes started getting passed, and we started to see these kind of broader regulatory regimes relating to employment. Um, how did the statutes define an employee, and how did courts interpret that definition? Yeah, so the the legislation is awful in terms of definitions. It either uh, didn't define the term employee at all, or it defined, defined it completely circularly. Um, it would define an employee as someone who worked for an employer, um, or it would define an employer as someone who has employees. It, it was it was completely circular, and the, the Supreme Court over time has, has recognized this. Um, but the, so what the courts, it was really sort of uh, delegated to the courts to figure this out. We've, we're using, Congress is using the term employee. Um, courts, you figure out what we mean by the term employee, and that's that's really the struggle. Um, they, they started drawing that distinction um, between sort of borrowing this common law concept of distinguishing between employer employees and independent contractors um, using what we what we call the right to control test. So in the in the paper you distinguish between sort of purposive ways of looking at the def statutory definition of an employee versus kind of common law approaches to understanding the definition of of an employee H how are those different and where where does each of them come from like what's the goal of each one of those approaches 
Yeah, so the a purpose of approach is really looking at what's the what's the aim of the of the statute, what's the aim of the act, um, as opposed to the the common law approach, which is just saying we're going to use these. Uh, factors, these multiple factors to draw the distinction, and this is the way that we've done it in tort law, and we're going to continue to do it in all of these other areas. Um, and so, you know, for example, if we're looking at a, you know, at uh, Title Seven, for example, we'd say, oh, the purpose of the law is to, um, you know, rid the U.S. of discrimination, right? Um, and in that. In that situation, when we're trying to figure out how we distinguish between employees and independent contractors, we'd keep that purpose in mind. Um, and so what tends to happen, um, and what tended to happen um, in some of the earlier cases, is that the courts would give a very sort of broad interpretation of the term employee um, so that it would capture sort of more more parties than, than it wouldn't. Um, as opposed to the common law approach, which um, tended to, to be narrower, um, and it would capture less parties. So it's my understanding from your paper that courts initially, when interpreting these statutes, tended to take a, re a relatively purposive approach to thinking about the definition of employee, but have shifted, at least in part in response to congressional objections to that way of thinking about the definition of an employee. Maybe you could talk a little bit about that history and how and why that shift happened. Sure, yeah. So what happened um, originally when the, the restatement, the first restatement um, of agency was published, it actually said we should use a purposive approach to distinguishing between employees and independent contractors. Um, they they talked about sort of the common law approach and said this makes a lot of sense for um, for imposing liability on in hiring on hiring parties for the negligence of their their hired parties um, but they said there's a lot of it recognized there was some other legislation that existed that um, used the term employee and they said you know we should consider the purpose um, and the courts actually started doing that it, and it really started with the National Labor Relations Act when it was first passed the um, the courts were taking sort of this, uh, some courts were taking a sort of common law approach, some were using a more purposive approach. Um, eventually, there's a case that goes to the the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court says, yes, we should we should look at the, the purpose of the act, we should interpret this term broadly to cover, um, to cover more people, to classify them as employees, so their, their sort of labor issues are covered, um, their ability to unionize and the like is covered. And um, and so once, and, and so this is this is fine, this is the, the law, and then Congress responds and says, no, um, Supreme Court, you, you got it absolutely wrong. Uh, they amend the National Labor Relations Act and change it to say, this specifically does not cover independent contractors. Um, about 20 or so years later, the Supreme Court gets another shot at it, and the same issue comes up, and the Supreme Court says, we got the message, Congress. Um, you know, we, we understand we're supposed to use, we're not supposed to use a purposive approach, we're supposed to use this common law approach, and so that was sort of the start of things. Yeah, I mean, if I may, I kind of got the impression that this in part reflected a kind of change in the polit political center of gravity of Congress as well. Like, in a sense that maybe when, in particular, the NLRA was passed, that Congress may have wanted the court to take a purposive approach to the definition of employee, but by the time they came about to actually interpreting it, the sort of political winds had changed, and maybe Congress didn't want the statute to apply quite as broadly and was like, hey, not so much unionizing here. I mean, is that like a fair read of what might have been happening? I, I think that's probably a fair read. I know there, I, I, I don't, uh, I'm not a, a labor scholar at all, um, but the, my my sense is that there was a lot of uh, sort of rancor <laughs> between uh, between the, the you know, various presidents and also um, uh, Congress and uh, during this time and labor was a major issue. Um, and so I, I think that that likely had a role um, oh yeah a role in the process <laughs> <laughs> so so we're we're both copyright people and of course this 
this sort of employee independent contractor distinction has played an important and sometimes confounding role in in copyright law. A, a lot of listeners might not be and might not be familiar with why it matters. So I mean, I wonder if you could just say a little something about sort of how the employee independent contractor distinction matters in copyright law and sort of how it's played out against the, this backdrop of the distinction between thinking in a purposive way as opposed to a kind of common law way about the definition of employee has has affected the 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 kind of development of copyright doctrine yeah so in copyright we draw uh, we draw the distinction between employees and independent contractors for purposes of the work made for hire doctrine and the work made for hire doctrine in short is trying to f determine who owns the copyright initially. Um, and so if you are a, a hiring party, you hire someone to create some type of, of copyrighted work for you. Um, if they are an employee and they create the work in the scope of their employment, then uh, the work for hire doctrine says that the employer the hiring party, they are considered to be the author and subsequently the uh, initial owner of the copyright. Um, if, though, they're an independent contractor, then unless there's a written agreement to the to the contrary and it falls within a, a certain number or falls into one of the categories that are described in the statute, um, then the hired party is going to be the initial copyright owner. Uh, and there's lots of effects that that result from that, um, and so the up until 1989, the courts so, sort of had the same struggle um, or a similar struggle as what was going on in the National Labor Relations Act, um, you know, 30 years before, of trying to figure out what's the test for distinguishing between employees and independent contractors. And there were you know, really four different approaches that the, uh, the Supreme Court lays out in its opinion in Reed, and the one one of which was this sort of common law approach. The, the court calls it an agency approach, but it's it's the same thing, um, where we use this sort of multi-factor test to uh, distinguish uh, between the two. Mm -hmm. And I was, and you know, I would say the you know some of the other approaches that it that it rejected, uh, it, it ultimately adopts this this common law approach, um, but it, it rejects a kind of a formal salaried employee test, which was one of the proposed tests, which used really a subset of factors that focused on some of the more objective measures, um, like you know, whether employee benefits were being paid to the hired party or whether uh, what, how the tax treatment was, was being dealt with, um, how regularly they were paid, um, stuff like that. And the court rejects that and says, no, we're not going to look at that. Um, and along the way, um, during its discussion, also rejects a, a purposive approach as well. Mm. Well, so in your paper, you present a study, pretty comprehensive study, of how courts have actually determined employee status. In other words, you know, in thinking about this kind of common law approach, like which factors they're applying and which factors seem to matter and why. I, I, can you talk a little bit about kind of how the study was designed and how you went about sort of compiling and analyzing the data? Yeah, so um, the study design it uses the, uh, the empirical technique of content analysis, which sounds fancier than it actually is. It's basically just reading a bunch of cases um, and encoding them and sort of reading them for, for specific things and coding the cases. Um, and so what, this, what we did in the study is we looked at all of these different areas, not all of them, we looked at many of the different areas where this distinction is drawn between employees and independent contractors in federal law using this common law test. And so a lot of the statutes that I mentioned before uh, are ones that, that we looked at, the NLRA, Copyright, ERISA, OSHA, ADA, ADEA, and Title VII. Um, and what we did is we essentially did sort of very broad Westlaw searches, um, and then we screened uh, pretty much all of the cases to determine whether or not they were you know, relevant um, or if they were sort of false positives. Um, we narrowed that down eventually and um, ended up with about 546 unique cases. 
um, spread across these these different uh, statutory schemes. And then what we did is my my research assistants and I we went through and and read them all um, where the the courts or, or the tribunals generally. Sometimes they were courts, sometimes they were uh, administrative agencies or boards like the National Labor Relations Board or the uh, Occupational uh, Occupational Safety and Health Commission. Um, and the uh, so we went through and essentially coded um, for a variety of different things. We looked at for each factor whether or not, well, so we looked to see what the ultimate result was, whether the, the party the hired party was an employee or independent contractor. Um, and then we looked at each of the factors that were addressed and coded them as either did they did the court say it favored employee status? Did it favor independent contractor status? Did it not address it at all? Um, and then we also looked at whether or not there was any weighting. So sometimes the tribunals would say, um, they'd say this, you know, this particular factor is very important in our analysis, or this particular factor um, really shouldn't be given much weight for one reason or another. And so we, we recorded whether it was either favored or discounted. Um, based on, and, and sort of along the way to make sure that it was that these were we were doing it correctly. Um, we did some you know, intercoder reliability testing to make sure that um, we weren't just all doing our own thing. Um, and we so we, we had to do you know, sort of many rounds of that to make sure we were all on the same page. We knew what we were looking for, um, and that's all in the in the article as well, showing our results and how these these are actually it's a, a valid method. <laughs> um, and then um, based on all the all the data we collected, I essentially ran. Uh, made four calculations. I looked at how um, how frequently each factor was addressed. I looked at whether it was consistent with the ultimate conclusion in the particular case, and then looked at whether it was weighted favorably or discounted, uh, and then sort of collectively uh, looked at them in each area of the law. Um, and that was that was basically the study in a nutshell. Mm. So, I mean, what kind of findings did did you turn up? I mean, were there particular factors that were more or less sort of salient to courts, and were those factors consistent across different areas of law, or did you see some inconsistencies in terms of what they thought was important in different contexts? Yeah. So it was. Um, there were factors that were consistent um, sort of across statutory schemes, and there were factors that were inconsistent. Then there were some that were like more or less consistent. Um, and so, you know, th but it was it was interesting that it also didn't really matter. Um, it wasn't particularly tied to how important, whether they were consistent Consistently important or consistently unimportant. So what I what I ended up doing for each section for each uh, statutory uh, uh, scheme was to look. I, I created a continuum for each uh, each one, and it showed sort of the least important factors and the most important factors, and I grouped them together based on um, the four calculations that that I made. Um, and so there were, I, I looked at sort of interesting things that took place within legislation, like interesting observations within legislation, and also looked at interesting observations across legislation. Um, and so I would say, you know, within the legislation, there there really were some, some interesting things. Um, so for like the National Labor Relations Act, uh, the top two groups, and there's generally like four or five groups per continuum. And the top two groups, the ones that were sort of the most important factors for the NLRA, um, weren't really that accurate. Um, I, one of the things I also calculated was, in, was accuracy. And so I looked at the factors in that group or two groups. And um, if a majority of those factors pointed toward the, uh, toward the result, to, you know, it was consistent with the ultimate result, then I counted it as an accurate prediction. And if it was less than half, that it, or half or less, then it was an inaccurate prediction. Um, and so I have, uh, on the continua, I have uh, various measures of how accurate the, the continua are, and the, or the groups of factors are. And um, for the NLRA, it turned out that like the top two groups, the most important factors, really weren't that 
important uh, or, or that accurate. They were certainly the most important, but they weren't that accurate in predicting the outcome. Um, and so this, to me, suggested that we're certainly lacking predictability and certainty in this area. And, you know, if I can maybe just back up a second and talk about that, if you read all of these Supreme Court opinions that talk about why we should adopt the common law test, uh, the reason that they, they give over and over again is we need to be able to enhance, we want to enhance predictability and certainty. And they said, if we adopt this, this you know, 12 plus factor test, it's going to improve predictability and certainty. And I, I think that's ridiculous, but, um, but that's what they say. Uh, and, and not only is it going to predict or is it going to increase predictability and certainty within a particular area. So within copyright law, we're going to have more predictable, more certain results if we have 12 factors that we're, we're balancing, but even ac with uh, across legislation so that when we see this term employee, and I think this is really what they're getting at, is when we see the term employee in federal law, it doesn't matter if it's a, the Copyright Act, if it's the Title VII, if it's OSHA, we will know we, with these, you know, highly predictable and certain factors that will know the result um, of of, an, of a hired party status. We'll, we'll know what they are. Um, and it turns out that that's not the case at all, uh, which probably isn't a, a huge surprise. Um, but the, so for the NLRA, not, uh, not very accurate. Um, for the Copyright Act, for example, um, we see some things that are kind of interesting, like you know the, the label that the parties put on the relationship, which is actually not a factor that's listed in the, in the restatement, um, but the courts sort of address it anyway. That's not terribly important in copyright. It turns out to be much more important in the anti-discrimination statutes, um, which is interesting in and of itself. Um, and, uh, you know, we see some we see some stuff like uh, OSHA, the Tribunals for uh, Occupational Safety and Health. They're they seem to be more hostile to some of the factors like benefits and tax treatment than other areas. So, like copyright and ERISA, for example, these are highly uh, valuable. They're they're uh, very accurate factors and um, very important in those areas. But OSHA much more hostile to those. So. I couldn't shake the feeling when I was looking at the results of your study that in some way it seemed like kind of purposiveness was sort of sneaking its way back in through which factors courts were considering and sort of how and why they were considering those factors. Do you think that's a kind of fair read, at least on what might be going on? Yeah, no, I think that's that's really what's, what is going on. Um, so despite, you know, 70 plus years of the Supreme Court saying don't take a purpose of approach, um, when you look at some of the factors, and, and it's not um, it's not a, a perfect picture that, that's painted here. Um, but there are some factors that really creep in that make it seem like a purpose of approach is, is being used. So, for example, in, in copyright law, um, the skill of the hired party tends to be one of the most important factors. And if you sit back and think about it for a second, like that's probably not shocking. We're dealing with the Copyright Act, which deals with creative works, which typically take a lot of skill. Um, and so it's not really that surprising that the skill factor plays uh, plays such a role. Um, we see sort of the opposite approach for the Americans with Disabilities Act, where the skill factor is actually not very important at all, um, or it's much less important than it is in the, the copyright context. And we could say, well, if we look at uh, individuals with disabilities, they may have, they may be lacking certain skills, um, uh, those who don't have disabilities, and so therefore the courts are trying to minimize uh, minimize that factor um, by thinking about what the act is trying to do. It's trying to protect individuals with disabilities. Well, if one way of doing that might be to to discount that factor. Yeah, I mean, I mean, one thing that really struck me too is like many of the laws that you're talking about really seem to go toward ameliorating social ills or, you know, kind of disfavored activities in one way or another, like, you know, preventing discrimination or encouraging workplace safety, you know, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, it seems like under those circumstances, we'd want as a policy matter to sort of have an expansive read 
on their application because it's not obvious why someone's employee status should be relevant to whether or not we want to prevent those kinds of bad things from happening. Yeah, I, I think that's that's true. Um, and it's during my research, I, I looked into this a little bit of like, you know, why do we why do we even draw this distinction between employees and independent contractors uh, for the reasons you mentioned? And it, it turns out that for some of these areas, there, there's nothing. I looked at a lot of the legislative history. And there's really not much in the legislative history to indicate why Congress drew this line um, where they did. Um, it, it seems to be it was just kind of uh, we're we're just doing it because that's that's what we've always done, right? Especially for the some of the more modern uh, legislation, whether it be you know ERISA or, or the ADA or ADEA, Title Seven, even um, yeah. Back to 1964, but it was kind of following what took place with the the NLRA, and um, yeah. So we 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 draw this. Congress has drawn this distinction, um, but it seems like it's in many instances it's just done it because that's the way they've done it in the past, and so we'll just keep doing it. And it's kind of rote at this point, um, without really giving much thought as to why we draw that distinction. Mm -hmm. Well, returning to, to copyright for a minute, which, of course, is a special interest of mine. I mean, it really struck me that, you know, the story you're telling about this sort of broad definition of employee across different federal statutory regimes explains a lot about sort of what was happening in Reed when the kind of court came up with this new way of conceptualizing the distinction between employees and independent contractors. I wonder if you could kind of place Reed in historical context and maybe reflect on what was going on and you know what the Supreme Court was thinking and if that provides any sort of explanatory power as to kind of why Reed was written and decided in the way that it was. Yeah, so I think the, um, I mean, I have a, a prior article um, on looking at the Copyright Act. It's basically doing this, this same study, but just looking at the Copyright Act. Um, and the, at, at the time, at least at the time that I wrote that article, that was in like 2014, 2015, um, I... I was under the the impression that Reed was it just it made no sense like they just they were very sloppy uh, the court was very sloppy in its opinion it didn't really um, it, it just it, it didn't really achieve the goals that it, it said that it was trying to achieve I think again with sort of certainty and predictability um, you know every time I, I talk about the multi-factor test when I teach copyright law and I and we talk about uh, certainty and predictability the students are always very excited about that and because they you know hey who doesn't love certainty and predictability um, and then we talk about the factors and I, and by the time we finish the case and we talk about the discussion and I say so what do you think is this really predictable and certain and they just laugh um, and I think that's the reaction that everybody has uh, to it but when I as I did this study and sort of looked at you know all these different areas um, I was, I was, I'm a little less critical of the Supreme Court now um, because I think what, one of the things that they were trying to do, what they're trying to do, was create this um, sort of harmony uh, across legislation. They didn't really want to have uh, the term employee um, to mean different things in different contexts, um, absent some, some clear statement by Congress uh, to the contrary. Um, and so I think they were really thinking about, well, we can have this sort of, we have this term, we want it to be uniform across uh, across the board, and so that's, uh, that's really important. And, you know, if there are some other issues that get in the way, uh, at least with respect to copyright, well, we'll get over that, right? Um, I... I don't think that was the right result. I, I'm, I, like I said, I'm, I'm under. I can understand why they did that, um, but I still think they got it wrong uh, at the end. Especially if you look at it, if you look back historically, not only did we have the National Labor Relations Act um, and the the amendment to it after the Supreme Court's decision, but there were we have the Fair Labor Standards Act which, again, very closely related with the National Labor Relations Act, um, that test actually, or that act actually uses a different test for employee status. And the, and 
and also the Social Security Act as well, um, they use a different test despite using the same term. And the the interesting thing is that the Supreme Court had decided those cases you know, either on the same day or relatively close to each other um, and said we're going to use this purpose of approach and Congress amends the NLRA. It does not amend the FLSA or the Social Security Act. And so by the time the court gets to uh, to revisit the NLRA in 1968, they say, well, um, yeah, Congress amended the NLRA, so we're going to treat it differently. Um, the FLS, the FLSA cases come up later and they say, well, they didn't amend that. So we're going to keep this broad interpretation. So it's, it's somewhat inconsistent, not somewhat, it is inconsistent um, in that they, they were trying to, when, when the court got to read in the copyright context, they were trying to have this consistent view across federal law, but they knew very well that it was already inconsistent at that point. Um, and it had been inconsistent for, um, for at least 20 years. Yeah, I mean, and one thing that especially struck me about this story, it was that's so weird about this sort of like historical conjecture that you're, I'm mean, compelling, I think, historical conjecture that, that you're presenting here, is that copyright kind of seems like an odd man out among these other statutes in the sense that with respect to a lot of these federal regulatory regimes, we don't want employers and employees to be contracting in or out of the regime based on their own kind of private wishes. We want the government to be defining when it, the law is going to apply and when it's not. But that doesn't like necessarily seem like it's the case in copyright. Like it seems like maybe we might be a little bit less concerned about it, parties contracting out of the employer employee relationship or into it for that matter in the context of, of copyright, given that it's ultimately just about sort of the disposition of ownership of whatever product is being produced. Yeah. It, so it's copyrights sort of the odd man out in that way. Um, and it's, it, it's interesting, uh, with respect to the, the label factor that I mentioned before, where the, the parties, um, sort of how they describe their own relationship can be, could be important. And in copyright, we, the courts have pretty consistently said that's not, that's not really important. Um, we're not going to let you, you know, label your, you know, we're not going to let the, essentially the higher, the hiring party say you're an independent contractor or you're an employee. Um, we're going to actually sort of peek behind the curtain and see what's, what's actually going on. Um, in contrast, if we look at like the anti-discrimination statutes, the label factor turns, turns out to be fairly important there. Um, and to me, based on what, what you were just describing of having sort of the, the kind of economic rights or sort of property rights versus these kind of social, social welfare um, programs or trying to, to protect people from anti-discrimination, um, there's kind of these sort of public uh, not public goods in the economic sense, but you know, sort of public rights, um, public law rights. Um, these are we we don't want those to be sort of waived um, or waivable, um, you know, except for in a, in a settlement uh, context. But the courts have essentially got it completely backwards in this scenario where we're gonna we're gonna actually look behind the curtain with respect to how property is disposed of, but with these uh, sort of public rights, these unwaivable uh, rights, the courts are like, eh, yeah, if you called yourself an employee, that's that's good enough. Or you called yourself an independent, independent contractor, that's fine with us. Um, and so that seems that seems backwards. The other way that, that copyright really seems to stand out from uh, from the others is the the way the employee status um, benefits the hired party. So in all the other areas, if you're an employee, you get the protection, right? You, you get protection against discrimination. You get protection um, to have a safe workplace. You get the protection of having your, uh, you know, retirement, uh, your retire retirement benefits protected. Um, you can, you can unionize. Um, for copyright law, it's, it's the opposite, right? If you're an employee, then you lose your property, the, you, you lose the copyright that you might have created. Um, and so copyright sort of stands out uh, in that way as well. Mm -hmm. Well, so Ryan, in closing, I wonder if you think that there are any kind of policy perspectives or 
kind of conclusions that maybe courts and legislatures ought to be considering uh, coming out of your paper? And also, you know, where do you see this project going from here? Do you have future plans around this issue? Because I know you've written around this area for quite some time. Yeah. So in terms of sort of next steps or where, places that uh, where Congress or the courts can go, you know, I, I, I lay out in the paper kind of three different approaches. Um, I, I, I conclude that if we're trying to get predictability and we're trying to get certainty, we've failed pretty miserably in that uh, in that goal. Um, so what could we do as a result? Well, one is, you know, we could we could have a, a purpose of approach, right? We could go back to what the the first restatement told us to do when it laid out the sort of the common law approach generally. It said if you're dealing with statutes, then take a purpose of approach. Um, that makes a lot of sense to me. It's gonna it's going to undermine consistency across legislative regimes, or legislative schemes, but it's going to uh, it would very likely increase predictability and certainty within a within a piece of legislation. Um, I'm, of course, realistic as well. That's not going to happen because it flies in the face of you know, 70 years of Supreme Court precedent. Um, the Supreme Court would have to reverse itself over and over in these cases. Um, you know, another approach, which I think is probably the best approach um, in terms of, you know, as a matter of policy, is we just stop drawing the line between employees and independent contractors. So, for example, you know, we talked a little bit earlier about, like, uh, you know, protecting, giving safe workplaces to employees, but not independent contractors, providing uh, or protecting against discrimination for employees, but not independent contractors. Well, we can ask, like, why is that okay? Like, why is it okay that it, it, it's, we can discriminate on race or gender or age um, for employees, but, or we can't do it for employees, but it's perfectly fine to do for independent contractors. Like, does that, does that make sense? Um, and, if it doesn't make sense, then maybe we should just stop drawing the line altogether. Now, there, there are some areas, so for example, like the Americans with, Americans with Disabilities Act, where um, they draw the line, and the concern, and this, this is in the legislative history, the concern that they had was, you know, there could be additional expenses, right? So you're an employer and you have to make reasonable accommodations. Um, it, it can't be an undue, uh, undue hardship, but you know, you maybe have to install a, a, a wheelchair ramp or something like that. And that, that costs money. And so Congress was concerned that if we, you know, if we had that burden on everyone, it might really harm small businesses um, and maybe put them out of business and this, this isn't good. Um, but we can think about, is, is drawing the distinction between the, the number of employees that you have versus the number of independent contractors, is this the right way to do it? Um, we could also draw the line at, let's say, like profits, like annual profits or annual revenue or something like that. Um, I think that has two benefits. One, um, it's actually more closely related to the, the harm that we're concerned about, um, which is, you know, these additional costs. Um, and so if we look at, like, how much money you're making, then if it turns out that you're making more than like X amount of dollars and you can afford to put in the ramp, then put in the ramp. And if you don't make that much money um, and it's really going to, you know, put your business under, it's going to kill your business, then maybe you don't put in the ramp. Um, that seems more closely tied to um, to the, the harm um, or the concern that we have than the number of employees you have. Because we can imagine an employer with, you know, 400 employees that's you know, barely breaking even, or we could imagine a really small business with like six employees that's making millions and millions of dollars. Um, employee status seems like a, a strange way to, to draw that line. Um, the other thing is, if we're looking at predictability and certainty, I can almost guarantee that it's much easier to figure out a company's you know, annual profits or annual revenue than it is to figure out whether somebody is an employee or, or independent contractor using 12 plus factors. Um, and so it might just be easier at the end of the day for, for everybody. Um, but again, that's going to 
require congressional action, and that's that's unlikely as well. Um, so if sort of the final approach that could be used is let's just use a subset of the factors. Um, and I think the higher or the the continua that I put out. Um, in the paper really could serve that purpose where we could say, all right, here's the top, you know, one or two groups. We're going to look at those, you know, four or five factors first. And if they, you know, mostly point in the same direction, then that's the end of the story, right? The person's an employee, the person's an independent contractor. If it's if it's split kind of down the middle, um, then go to the next the next group of factors kind of as a tiebreaker. Um, in effect, that's really what we're doing now, and so we could just sort of formalize it. It doesn't. It doesn't um, fly in the face of Supreme Court precedent. They said, you know, you need to consider these factors, but they didn't say how we're supposed to, you know, weight them. Which ones are the most important, least important? Uh, it doesn't require Congress to do anything, and it may actually achieve what we're trying to achieve. So those are sort of the suggestions um, that I give going forward in terms of of next steps on this project. So I, I indicate in the paper there's uh, sort of lots of questions that uh, come up with respect to which, you know, we've looked at these different factors and some of them seem to uh, be more important and some seem to be less important. Um, some of them make sense, some of them don't make sense. And so I think one of the next steps I'd like to do is look at why. Why is, you know, factor why? Why is that not important in the, you know, the ADA context, but it is important in the Title VII context um, or, you know, different factors in, in uh, different areas um, and trying to sort of sort out what's going on and, and see if we can figure out what's going on in the, in the mind of courts to the extent that courts have minds. <laughs> awesome. Well, thanks so much, Ryan. It's been a pleasure talking to you about this paper, and I look forward to the, to the next uh, work you do in the area. Great. Thanks for having me. This has been fun. They search for employment, none can be had. Anyway, you go, you bound to meet people sad. They search for employment, none can be had. They start to drop down dead in the street. Nothing to eat and nowhere to sleep. Our kind-hearted employers, I appeal now to you, give us some work to do. Asking for equality to rank with the rich in society, to visit their homes in their motor cars, or to go to their clubs and smoke their cigars. We are asking for a living wage to exist now and provide for old age. Our kind hearted employers, I appeal now to you, give us some work. Persons hadn't a meal, they were too decent to beg, too honest to steal. They went looking for work mostly everywhere, but saw sign board mark, no hands wanted there. The government should work the wastelands and hills, build houses, factories and mills, reduce taxation, and then we would be really emancipated from slavery. <laughs> Our only quarrel and fret about unemployment, but haven't relieved us yet. There is no vision that we can see to take us out from tribulations and misery. We can't fight physically, for we wouldn't prevail on account of ammunition, cruel laws, and jail. But every man was born to be free from this oppression and tyrannic slavery. 